Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Hi, this is Randy Kay with the Heaven Series. My guest today is Tina Schmidt. Now, this is going to be a roller coaster ride for you. This is a very unique interview in that there are multiple experiences that Tina had when she died and when she had suffered initially as a child a head injury, but she had subsequent to that and being having been in a coma, she experienced Jesus, she experienced angels, she experienced heaven. And her account is absolutely wonderful because at the end of this, and you're going to have, you're going to want to watch uh, through to the end, you're going to be inspired by how the Lord uh, communicated with Tina on an ongoing basis. She's a very special guest for us uh, today. And uh, Tina, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Randy. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a service to the Lord. And I, I really pray that my testimony is a blessing. That's really what we're here for. That's what it's all about. So thank you. Well, yes, and amen to that. You know, uh, we're going to start, Tina, with your experience when you were a child uh, and you suffered a head injury, yeah. and then we're going to continue down the line to multiple experiences that you've had that God has gifted you with. Uh, so let's start there. Uh, what happened uh, that caused this severe head injury and your first encounter with God? Well, um, my uh, this head injury happened in 1966. I was five years old. And um, I was playing around in the yard and, I, you know, I, in that time, I was a latchkey kid and our parents weren't around and our brothers got home from school. Most of the time uh, we were watching ourselves and uh, I fell. I, I jumped up on something and I was reaching for a, a rope, slipped and fell and crashed, slammed the side of my head um, on a on a. a, a, a one of those garden bricks that, you know, go around the garden. It was actually uh, this right side of my head. And uh, it crushed my skull inward. And um, I had this uh, acute epidermal, epidural hematoma. And I, re I don't remember that event, but later uh, it was explained to me because my brothers had to call uh, my mom and all of this. Well, um, I remember going to the hospital, uh, waking up, uh, barely seeing, you know, people kind of hovering over. And then I was, I was out of my body looking down. And then suddenly I was back in my body with a, uh, some kind of an oxygen mask or something over me. And there was a smell of this rubber smell that I didn't like. And I popped out of my body. <clears throat> now, as a five-year-old, I think at five years old, you just observe things and you don't draw any conclusions. I was just observing and I went down below the, the gurney table and I could see the legs of the doctors and I was sort of like a ball, just a, a little helium balloon, just kind of bouncing along the ground. And then suddenly I was swept away. The next thing I remember was being in what I would call now, because now I know it was the, the second heaven, which is the domain of the enemy. And I remember looking up and seeing this huge creature and everything was ghastly gray, like, like in, a, in a murky area. And this huge creature was constructed of a cacophony of spirits. It looked like billions of wormy spirits all over that formed this creature that looked kind of like a in the shape of a, a man or a human. And it had eyes and um but and the sounds were just awful. It was a it was a shock and I'm looking and looking and then it appears to me I didn't see this being next to me but there was someone protecting me 
And I began to get scared for my family. And I knew when I looked at this big entity that it had dominion. There was just something in me that knew beyond being a five-year-old. I just knew that this thing had dominion and it was powerful. And then it could have been my angel or Jesus. Someone pointed because I started getting scared and he pointed down and I saw an expansion of the earth open up. And then I began to see these lights, these little glowing lights flashing. And as he told me to look and I looked, I began to, I don't know, like a telescopic where you start to close in and look. And I began to see that these lights were people. And I was looking for my family. And then that's about all I remember up until coming out of a coma. Now on the earth side, my mom, she had been praying because apparently I didn't pass any of these reflex, you know, brain reflex tests. You know, you poke you in the eye with a Q-tip and you don't blink or they get you on the bottom of foot with a needle. They did all of these reflex tests back then and I wasn't responsive. So um, in the surgery part, what they did was they had to, because the, the, the epidural hematoma had crushed my head in, uh, it began to press in on the brain and then the bleeding went internal and blinded me. So the, they, they I, I don't know how they, they do these tests in the x-rays or whatever, or but they said that uh, the pressure had built up on my optic nerve and I maybe wouldn't even be able to see if I came out. So they cut a hole in my skull, they let the brain swell to the outside and then just had to wait and see and let all the bleeding come out because it was crushing on the inside. Anyway, she, I didn't pass these tests. She prayed, she was a, my mom was a, a Methodist, but I wouldn't say she was a really deep praying woman, but she did pray and she said, God, what do I do? Do I, you know, leave her on life support? Do I, what do I do? I have to make a decision. And God gave her a vision that I was sitting up in a, in the hospital bed with bandages. So she felt, okay, that's my sign. And she told the physicians, just keep her going. And eventually I came out of it. And when she walked in to see me, I was exactly like she had seen with these bandages over my head. And what I remember is actually being in the hospital. I do remember seeing my mom coming at, uh, by the door and then later coming out of the hospital, I remember looking in the mirror, I was completely shaved off. You know, they had made me bald. So I looked like a boy. And I saw this Frankensteinian scar just like this with big stitches. And I went, wow, that's, it's really weird, you know? And that's the part, that's all I remember. But what I didn't understand is that had opened a door that didn't close for most of my life until many years later when I got it right with Jesus. This was an open wound that had let, um, it was an open wound to my soul. It was an open wound in my body. So um, I recovered. Um, my stepmom bought me my first Bible in, when I was in third grade. I got turned on to Jesus and all these beautiful pictures, you know, kids Bible. And I wanted to know who this Jesus guy was and who are these people that have these miracles happen? I was thirsty and hungry for him. But there was no one in my family really well versed to, to this. And so, um, but it started me on an ambition to be an artist because I saw all these beautiful illustrations of animals and people. And I said, oh, you know, and, and God had blessed me to be an artist. So I, it, it awakened some awareness in me. I didn't really feel that again until um, I was about 13 when I got saved. And uh, I, be, uh, went into a ch church uh, with some friends. I got involved in the youth groups and I loved it. And I got saved by Jesus and I felt a tangible presence of the Lord, his love pouring over me. And I had never felt that. Now I grew up in a very difficult environment, very abused one by our dad. And, um, but our, my mom and my stepmom were amazing women. They were just awesome, but they, they, you know, there was trouble there in the family. And, and I remember that before it was a purity and a, an acceptance love. And so 
that was my first revelation of this world. It was this special love. And I wanted to pursue the Lord and um, life came along. I think it's it, what happened at that was he gave, started to awaken a perception in me I didn't have before. And, and it was a gift he gave me, a discerning spirit, because that's what got me out of the kind of um, destructive home, home life. And I moved out at 17 on the hope and the promises of the Lord that I can do something with my life. There's hope for me. There's, there's, I don't need to be stuck in this, this paradigm of failure and misery. And that accident from my head had caused a lot of pain and trauma in my body. So I grew up with a sick consciousness. I don't know how to explain this, but it's a paradigm of reality that you exist in. And that's all you know, because you don't know anything outside of that. And I grew up with a, a paradigm of pain and suffering. And so I knew I had to break free of that on some level, but I was not totally aware of all the powers in the spirit that God had availed us. At 17 years old, I moved out. I started, uh, I was still in high school and I got a job. I was working and going to school, trying to finish high school, being the only uh, graduate in my family other than my mom. Uh, this was new, you know, it was like I'm going into new territory about stepping into the world and going to school and accomplishing something. Nobody had done that. It was a very uh, chaotic upbringing. But I, what I, I found so amazing is um, Jesus was there still. And there was a presence uh, that came even when I would praise, you know, between my workload or school, I, you know, take out the guitar and start praising. Um, and then I had worked so hard that I had um, gotten pneumonia and I became very sick. I didn't have any medical insurance. Going home was not a, on my table. There wouldn't be no way I was going to ever go back home. So, so I tried to handle all, all of this load myself and I got ill working and going to school and not get enough sleep. And I got pneumonia and I was so ill that i when I uh, fell asleep, one time I fell asleep flat on my face and I suffocated on the pillow face down. And I was deathly ill without uh, any help. And um, this event is the second near-death experience. Now, um, what happened was I came to consciousness, uh, like just in that sweet spot, just before you wake up, you start to click in and you start to become aware. And I heard what I thought was a drum and I'm like, who's playing this drum? And I hear boom, 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 you know? And I'm like, I wish that person would stop playing that drum. And then what happened is this drum got slower and drawn out and it went boom, boom, boom. That was it. And I thought, oh, they stopped. I thought it was a neighbor. And then suddenly I started feeling excruciating pressure that if you could take your whole entire body with every sensation you have and shrink it up the size of a golf ball, that's what I felt. I felt like every part of me was just going. And suddenly I felt pressure. It's weird to feel two things at once, one being crushed and another to feel pressure, but I felt pressure coming out of the back of my head. And suddenly there's this popping sound. And I popped out of the back side of my head and I could see my hair, my head, and I began to float up out of my body. Um, this was the most traumatic and horrifying experience I had ever had. And instinctively, I started trying with invisible limbs, trying to get back into my body. And um, I kept floating up uncontrollably. The further I got away from my body, the more I screamed at the top of my lungs, if I had lungs, but I could hear my spirit voice just yelling and screaming like terror, okay? And then suddenly the weirdest thing happened. I was like this hovering above my body and suddenly I was pulled out like a ribbon, like a string and I could feel it go and I was stretched out and then suddenly I landed into another part of hell. So, 
It was the most bizarre experience. I'm sorry, Tina. Another part of, of hell. what now? Hell. H -E -L. hell. Of hell. Okay. Sorry, yes. I, you I yourself actually, in hell. I ended up in this amazingly horrible place. I had a 360 degree view. It was ghastly. Um, it was a, the, a decaying part of hell worse. It, it, it was something pretty dreadful. Um, smells and sounds of a decaying uh, realm. And it was gray and there was a hazy, hazy light in the background. And I am puzzled and I have this 360 degree view. And then I see these entities coming towards me. Now, when I get to this part, I do not want to be descriptive. I do not want to create in people's imaginations these things. I'm not about edifying the kingdom of the darkness. I'm going to skip the, the details because I know that in, you know what we think, Jesus says, be careful what you think. And so I do not want to propagate these images. But I will tell you, it was very bad. And something like out of Indiana Jones, that's all I'm going to say. It was pretty bad. Um, I screamed. This one of them grabbed me and clawed at me, and I screamed. And um, I, it seemed like I was screaming for eternity. Like I was left in there for the longest time. And, and I, 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 I have no explanation for how I got back. I just know I was screaming and screaming. And suddenly I went streaming back and went popped back into my body, filling up like a glass, like I was fluid. And I went from my feet, plugging into every sensation all the way up my body, like I was liquid pour, poured into a jar, just connecting with connecting. My soul was connecting to, my soul cells were connecting to all my body cells. I mean, it was like, and then I heard that drum again and it started beating slow. It was like, then it went, It was my heartbeat. And I recognized it finally. I went, oh gosh, that's my heartbeat. And then I barely uh, took me, I think that drum was beaten for five minutes before I could turn over. And I, I turned and I felt like lead. And at that point I decided, okay, I, whatever I've got, I've got to go take care of it. And I went to the hospital um, and it, um, it was pneumonia. So I didn't realize that I had been suffocating unable to breathe, and then just died on my pillow. But this opened up a lot of trauma for me because I had when I took it to the church people, all they kept saying was it's demonic, but they didn't give me a solution. There was no, well, just pray about it. And I did pray about it, Randy. I prayed and prayed, and it, it really frightened me that I had no recourse and no way to know what to do. So this led me into trying to go more into the Bible, but also I was trying to find out in other religions if they had a, an answer for this, you know, why, how could you go outside of your body? I mean, it was terrifying. And, and then um, uh, I, I, I learned about the Lord and, and I kept trying to connect more with, with the Lord, but it, there was just too much of this other paradigm, this other reality that kept kind of overshadowing. It finally quieted down. I, I finally, I was praying. I got a, a closer to the Lord. It, it quieted down. And then um, I, uh, I think I, I, all I could say is I found, I, I got it managed, put it that way. Um, occasionally there would be a spontaneous happening that I would have to say, okay, calm down, calm down. Just think about the Lord. Just think about, you know, your body just relax and I'd wake up and everything would be okay. What I didn't understand was that injury from the childhood had left this open door and it was something I had to deal with. Um, and uh, I, I was able to close it later, but I had to do a lot of learning in the Lord before that. And there was, uh, so Tina, there appears to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, so you suffered this traumatic injury as a child, young child, mm -hmm. uh, and you suffered through some abuse uh, yes. with your uh, father. Yeah. So you had that trauma as well. That was yes. a, um, a soulful kind of abuse, if you will. Mm -hmm. And that carried forth, you became 
a believer in Jesus as your Lord and Savior uh, into your youth. And then this accident happened where you uh, were suffocated to death, basically, and your heart stopped. And you had this hellish experience. Um, and then you went back to the church and they were saying, telling you that, well, this is a demonic attack or something like that. Um, but, but there seems to be this kind of cathartic process, if you will, that the Lord is bringing you through uh, to expose you to the darkness of your soul. Yeah. Uh, I may be over-interpreting uh, to bring you to a point uh, where he can shed his light uh, on your life and cause healing in you. So take yeah. us to what, that, what the process is of healing that the Lord is bringing you to uh, subsequent to this experience uh, in hell. Well, I have to share um, that the part of this whole thing about this healing process has to do with the life of my brother. In 1985, my, I got a call uh, that my brother was in the hospital. And he was 31 years old, a young man. And he had gone in for some surgery. So I said, okay, I'm going over. I got some magazines for him, you know, to visit my brother. And then he turns out um, he didn't do well. He wasn't recovering from the surgery. And I, um, we, the doctors were kind of stunned. Um, four days later, he went into a coma. And after that, they had to do a, a tracheotomy on him. Um, he was not recovering. And uh, they had done several uh, opened him up and he had a lot of bleeding. They couldn't sew everything together. And so um, about 10 days into this and, and his condition was worsening and he had to have a lot of different IVs and transfusions and all of this. And we were all puzzled. I was 24 and his condition worsened and I kept praying. And um, one day in the morning um, I heard an angel come over to me. I heard a voice and he said, uh, Tina, your brother is going to pass away on, and he gave me the date. And I opened my eyes and I looked around. I thought it was someone in the house. And uh, then um, I, I didn't want to believe it because I was God, no, that's not going to happen. God, you're going to save my brother. That's all there is to it. And I was there every single day and night at the hospital. I was willing him to live. I was with him. And uh, finally, we got to a point I had to call my mom out from another state and said, look, he, he is losing weight. He's not getting better. The doctors have him on life support. She came out. And I think within two weeks, we had gotten right to the night before that date that the angel had told me. And I said, we got to go down. I, I, we got to go down to the hospital and say our goodbye. So it was a really interesting thing that um, we were on each side of him, my mom on one side and me on the other, and he was in a coma and he's on life support. I began to talk in a way I could never repeat. It was as though I was a vessel and the Holy Spirit took over. And I started st saying things about his life, talking to him in his ear telling him how much God loved him, how God understood all the trouble that uh, in his life and the suffering, how he was forgiven, how everyone in his family loved him and wished he was there. Uh, I was ministering to him. This is before, you know, the, he's in a coma and I'm ministering to him and I'm only 24, but the amazing power that poured out from me, it wasn't me. And it was something his soul needed to hear because he took a deep breath and his heart rate was like 170, went down 150, then it dropped, dropped. It went finally went down to 70. It was just normal. And we hadn't seen that since he'd gone into the hospital. So then um, my mom said uh, her goodbyes. We went home and the next day he passed away. Um, after the service and the funeral, when I got uh, uh, everything I had to organize, get people together, organize the funeral, get all the stuff done. Finally got mom back home. Um, it had been a long haul for me because I'd been care felt like I had been carrying hope for him. And I was burned out. I went to sleep. I crashed exhaustingly on my bed. And the most amazing thing happened. Suddenly, I found myself being lifted up and shot through 
all I can say was like a, a wind tunnel. And I'm, I'm going at lightning speed, just, whew, and I'm hearing like get wind blowing past me. I'm seeing flashes of light. And then this opening in the distance goes whew, right here. And I'm, I hit the ground running. I don't know how I knew I was supposed to run, but I was running as fast as I could, you know, just hauling. And up ahead is I see this little guy in the distance running towards me. It was my brother and I was in heaven. And I could see the green pastures and the fields and the, the beautiful trees and the music. And he comes running into me and we just slam together, embraced. And I can't tell you what a joy that was. It was all the sorrow was gone. He was alive. He was alive. He was alive. And we, were, we embraced and held each other. And finally, we stood back and I looked at him and he was completely transformed. His body was healed. He was strong in a, in a not like his earthly body. And he had loved the Lord. He had when and I remember when I was younger, he actually him and my other brother had talked to me about Jesus more than my mom. They they love Jesus. What happened in their life afterwards, because life kicks in, I don't know, but I know that they had loved the Lord. And his he used to have a tattoo on his chest, a cross for the Lord. And that cross was gone because he didn't need to bear that cross. He was in heaven and Jesus was with him. And so I'm looking at him and we were talking about different things. He, I asked him, he didn't remember anything bad. There was nothing bad that he had remembered, but he said he remembered me talking to him, um, helping him um, on that last night. And it brought me such joy. And then other family members came running towards me at full speed. They, they put their arms around me. They were smiling and I'm like looking at him like, yeah, okay, you're here too. Anyway, yeah, and I went back and started talking to my brother. Those family members had not passed away yet, but they did later. So go figure how the Lord in his amazing power can, can do that. I don't know. I was looking at family members who had not yet passed away, but who later passed away before me. I don't know how he does that, but it was sheer joy. It was a beautiful experience. And when I came back, um, this is a really strange thing, Randy, and I'm sure you can uh, relate to it, where you have this amazing experience, you know there's a part of your soul consciousness that's been awakened in your spirit. You know heaven. You know there's joy. It's perfect. Everything is perfect. And you're perfect in that place. But then when I came back, I noticed as I came back, oh, an angel led me back. It was either the Lord or an angel. It was like, you have to go now. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to go, but I had to go. When I came back, I remember coming back and then this other layers came over my soul. And, and in that layering was my earthly identity, you know, Tina, the worker, Tina, the student, Tina, the whatever, all of this seemed completely back into place. And along with it came the pain. I would think that since I saw my brother, it would just disappear, but it didn't. There was still this heartache of missing him on this side. And that started me on an amazing journey in the Lord. You know, it was, it was really amazing that you have this heavenly identity and, and then yet you have this earthly identity and they were on two opposite ends. And I, I, I wanted this heavenly identity and yet I was here. And so it set me on a journey, um, really a journey in Christ and in his spirit. And um, I think that's where, uh, that's where, you know, the glory started to come in. I start, he started journeying me on, on an amazing, amazing um, uh, walk with him. Wow. Um, just to kind of encapsulate where we're at in this journey, Tina, um, I have a, a quick question now. Did your brother, uh, so he died? Yes. And, and you actually, the Lord had told you when he would die. Yes. 
And so that's an amazing part in and of itself. He actually uh, prophesied, he gave you the prophecy of his exact date. death, foretelling exact his death. Date. Yes. And, and so your brother died. Um, you saw him in heaven. Yes. So the Lord took you there to experience heaven, transported you there. And yeah. he, uh, I've, I've written about this and I've spoken about how our uh, future is in God's past. So, you know, so he's showing you the people that are going to be in heaven. You're seeing your brother in heaven. I know that's yeah. a dynamic that we can't fully comprehend, but it certainly is. Uh, if you, if you look at the biblical um, context, that certainly uh, can tell us, kind of help explain uh, that dynamic. Um, so you are on this journey and the Lord, I, this is just breathtaking, Tina, because the Lord is in a healing journey with you to bring you to the fullness of his glory. And our prior guests have had maybe a one uh, experience where they've died and they've experienced heaven, in some cases hell, uh, but yours is a journey. Yours is a journey. And this next step in your journey after you've been to heaven and having been to hell is this, uh, you, you call it uh, 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 the realizing the full glory of God. So can't wait to, to hear about that next uh, step yeah. in your life. Yeah, Randy. So um, it, it, what I think the Lord does is he throws tidbits out there. And he, he's not going to force himself on us. He's not going to say, I want, I command you to do this. What he does is the same thing he did with Adam and Eve. You have choice. You have a choice. And so he opened this door to heaven and it was like, yeah, that's, this is a choice you make. And um, I wasn't that smart back then. I was pretty dense. It took a lot of, I think it took a lot of threshing on the threshing floor, um, and, you know, they say that talking about the refining of the silver, it takes seven times to refine that silver and bring out, take off the dross. So there was a lot of um, challenges, I would say, that I had to go through. But um, um, in that, uh, I, I'll, as time moved forward, I'll share this other event. I, I um, in my third near-death experience, it, that third near-death experience had buckled my immune system and led me to have cancer later. But in this third near-death experience, there was uh, um, a encounter where uh, I went into anaphylactic shock. I got shot out my chest. I had a reaction to medication. And now this is the real interesting part, how, how God was able to um, expose this to me. But I found myself as a reaction to medication and having two anaphylactic shock experiences. I found myself in the same situation my brother was. I was swelled up, my body was swollen, and my, immune, my system was buckling down. My heart rate had been up to 150 for weeks. And uh, in this one um, event, I, I had fever that had been burning me up and I shot out the front of my chest and encountered um, another, aspect of the second heaven. And uh, it wasn't fun. There was a lot of challenge there. I, I met what I would call the grim reaper. But when he tried to uh, grab me, I said, in the name of Jesus, let go. And he wouldn't let go. And then I looked down at my wrist and I saw that Jesus had provided a, like a veil between his hand and the death, spirit of death and my arm. And I knew that was the Lord. And I ripped my arm out of his grasp. And I, I had some chutzpah. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to get away from me. And it did. It shrank away. In the next instant, um, and I felt someone shove me back into my body because I'd been standing at the foot of my bed. And he s shoved me back. I was back in the body. My heart rate was up. And finally, I could awaken my husband. And we went off to the hospital. And um, that's when I was in the hospital and they didn't know what was wrong and we were praying. And suddenly I saw a flash of my brother while I'm laying there. And I saw the flash of him. And then an angel said, allergy, allergy. And so we called the doctor over. 
the, the ER physician, and I said, I'm allergic to whatever you're giving me. Well, they were, they had put me on acetaminophen, which was the same, it was in the IV bag that, that my brother had. And so my brother had been allergic to it and we never knew how, why he died. Well, in this situation, God had shown me, this is something that your brother died from and they're feeding it to you. So I, I told the doctor, I, I'm allergic to whatever you're giving me. They took me off all the medication, took me off whatever was in there. It took me two years to recover. Now, that was uh, quite an experience. And then uh, because of that, my immune system had been buckled and I got cancer. Now, when I got cancer, there was a part of me, you're not gonna believe this, but when I got cancer, I had a spirit of joy. And I said, Lord, you're bringing out that thing I had hidden in me. I was afraid of all my life because my mother had died of cancer and other family members had died around me. And I felt this spirit of death was just following right behind me. So this was a, a, a challenge. And I said, Lord, I'm not going to die from this. You brought me to this fear because you're going to take me through it and, and I'm going to be healed. And I prayed and prayed when they did that surgery, all the, 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 the cancer was gone. So from the time they diagnosed me and even had done biopsies, they found the cancer, they, all the x-rays and the, 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 you know, the other things they do to, to detect it were there, they saw it, but when they took, did the surgery, it was gone. So uh, that was a, a great uh, experience for me to know that um, God was right there. Within, I had the surgery and four days later, I was full-time back on my job. I even had the surgery drain bags, whatever they call them for the surgical site. They were still hanging off of me and I, I hit them, I wrapped them around and I went to work and I said, Lord, you say, when we're down, get up and walk. I'm not gonna entertain this disease. I'm not gonna let it win me. And I said, get up and walk body. My spirit was like, come on, get up and walk. So I did and I never looked back, you know? And then in, in 2015, Jesus took me to heaven and I saw the most amazing thing. I had come through so much and we were still faced with these other challenges, some of them external, um, you know, challenges that go on in life. And in this supernatural experience, Randy, it, it was the topper of, of all things. I was taken to heaven and it answered a thousand questions for me. I saw this glory of color and life just coming at me and exploding like, like you would see a supernova. It just went, and I saw this explosion of color and it fanned out like, I, it just fanned out like this. And as it came out towards me at the other end of that was Jesus. And he was on a throne of glory, I saw masses amount of waves of life and color, thousands of colors we can't perceive with our physical eyes, colors that just, it just boggled my mind. And I'm staring in this force, this power, this immutable, uh, sovereign power of creation. And here is Jesus. He's sitting on what looks like a cloud throne. It's it's, it's a throne, but there's these clouds around him. Every color is just beaming off of him. I saw he had like a bluish robe, but even the blue robe was alive. It just, everything was life. And I knew at the core of my being, I was looking at the life, the source of all life was this powerful being. And it was Jesus. Up on his, towards his head, it was brighter than the sun but I could look into it without burning my eyeballs out. I could look into it and I saw his eyes, his nose, his mouth, a little bit of this beard, but it, the rest of it was beaming glory. And I could have stayed there a million years and just basked in honor of this amazing God. Mm. And, and, and then I saw his crown. I look up and on, there's like this, it's not like a metal crown. It was made of light going around his head. 
And it had beams shooting off like this in all directions. And even that crown seemed to echo, it was golden light. And it seemed to echo more, 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 more. Like they say he wears a crown of many crowns. Okay. And he, this thing was alive and it was just beaming lights out. And it was just radiating these waves of light. And I'm looking at him like in just total awe. And then I see this rainbow that expands over his head. And it, it kind of like, you know, when you, you spray your lawn with the water and you spread the water out, how you see that wave of a rainbow. Well, these waves of light bursting off of his head had this rainbow up over his head. And Randy, I, I was just stunned. I was floored that this is my Jesus. This is my King of Kings, my Lord of Lords. The, there was just no, I, I was so full. I, every bit of me could not even express the glory that he held. I just, there's no way. And I'm basking in this glory. And then he does something, Randy, that was just amazing. It seemed as though he reached over and went like this over my head, just, just kind of like over my head. And cat, suddenly this deluge of love, bliss, joy, just poured down this rate, slow like this. And he wanted me to understand every sensation, every nuance, and to understand everything in that blessing. It poured down over me, over through every bone, every neuron, every nerve, every muscle fiber, every cell of my body, every cell of my spirit, every cell of my soul. It was all encompassing. And it came pouring down like a liquid love, liquid oil, just, but thick, like real thick, like an energy, just sweetly pouring through. And my whole body was just immersed in this. And it was what the Lord was showing me. He didn't say a word. He was demonstrating his deep and most profound love for me. Now, I'm no one special. I'm a sinner. And I was a, I was a bigger sinner back then. He loved me. Even when I was corrupted, uh, he just poured this out. When I look back from where I was in 2015 to where I am now, I'm a, I'm a different person because there was still a lot of stuff to get out of me. There was a lot of deliverance that needed to be done, a lot of repentance. But this wonderful Jesus poured it out over me all. And I felt, I felt bliss, the, the joy and the love turned into bliss. And we were loaded with problems back then. There was a lot of stuff going on. Um, my, one of my dogs died and my horse had to be put down. And uh, we were making lots and lots of changes going on. And uh, I was still dealing with some health issues. The cancer was gone, but other, you know, these things pop up. And so he had blessed me with this and suddenly none of that mattered. And all the questions I had in my heart and soul were answered and it didn't, it, it didn't matter. I was in the presence. I was in the presence of God. I was in the presence of this amazing Lord. And none of the concerns I had, they were washed away. It was like, it didn't matter. And, and I walked around like this on cloud nine, so to speak. I walked around with this blessing. It lasted a long time. Even to this day, I still reflect on it and I still draw upon power. Is it that power, what he released on me has continued and will continue through an eternity. We, have, we think linearly here. We think in these linear boxes, but what he released on me then is still radiating and I draw upon it. I can still draw upon it and go back to that. We say it's back to that, but no, he hasn't changed that. He is still radiating that and I draw upon it frequently and it refreshes and revives me. And that is the presence, the presence of the Lord. It's amazing. It washes away everything and it is his purest love for you. It's, it was just an amazing um, it was a life changer, amazing life changing event. You know that, um, Tina, we've been riding this journey with you. We're not at the end yet of this story, but we're we're getting close. So okay. um, everyone needs to stay tuned to the very end because there's something uh, that the Lord is speaking through this experience 
and to those who are viewing this currently. And that is, um, we are witnessing, Tina, the healing process of the Lord Jesus yeah. uh, that applies to each of our lives. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, there was a either a curse or some influence, certainly, that, uh, that the demons uh, had upon your life that was inflicted upon you through abuse. Uh, you had a head injury that translated into subsequent other injuries. I'm, I'm looking through my clinical eyes now that you had some residual effect of, of that head injury uh, that led to the anaphylactic shock that you experienced later on. And then you had uh, a diagnosis uh, that was treated by, by something that caused an allergic reaction that was probably genetic because your brother had, uh, had uh, shared that as well and, and eventually died. So you were saved from that. So you had two accounts that were demonic of a demonic nature. This is part of that spiritual warfare going on, that influence that carried over where the enemy is just saying, you know, I'm going to take you down. And then, so God is saying at the very inception, Tina, I'm, I'm taking you up. I'm, I'm freeing you of all of this. Right. I'm releasing you of the burdens. You suffered cancer. You suffered um, a death or near death uh, four times. Uh, and uh, we'll get to this, this uh, kind of closure to the event, but there is a journey that we've been going on with you that is applicable to each of our lives and how the Lord brings us through the darkness to the light of Jesus. And yeah. so you're at this point now in your journey now where you are, the glory of the Lord is just all over you, Tina. Uh, the, the joy of the Lord, which is your strength, uh, through every trial and tribulation that you might have experienced in the past and also uh, currently and, and will in the future, carries you through that victoriously. So take us, if you will, Tina, now to uh, you have this experience and you've had your near-death encounters and uh, you actually came to us with a story. You didn't ask to be published. You didn't ask to be um, interviewed, we approached you after you shared your story on our website. Um, take us now to kind of where the Lord brought you on this journey now of this uh, mountaintop experience in heaven, seeing the glory of Jesus. Take us to that next event in, uh, in your life. Okay. Um, there, uh, we think, you know, it, we tend to think in our life, like life is like a movie. You, you start here and then you're going to end at the top of the mountain and, and the hills are alive with the sound of music. And we think that's where it ends, but we know that we have valleys. So we're sometimes we're up in the light. Sometimes we're down in the valley. And I would say that experience of experience in the Lord prepared me for the valleys. And so um, we, we um, but here's the thing. Through these other challenges, I had one more. This would be my fourth near-death experience in which um, I, it's too much to go into now. So I'm going to, I think, you know, for time, I want to say, though, that um, what, what I learned, it's not these, it's not these near-death experiences that are important. It's what we learn out of them. It's what we're, what are we gleaning? What is the Lord teaching us through them? And so... What I came to understand <clears throat> is that there's this paradigm that we are built into when we're born and the enemy imprints us. You're this, you're that. He gives us these mental scripts. You're no good. You'll never make it. Um, oh, well, you, you know, this is going to happen. That's going to happen because it happened to so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. And we get inundated. This is imprinting. And it's like when you have a baby horse and you imprint it to not be afraid of you, you handle it when it's young, you do all these things so that that horse grows up to be friendly and obedient and the training is easier. Well, when we're born here, we're imprinted by the enemy because Adam and Eve imprinted to the enemy when they turned to him and they thought they would take, they didn't trust the Lord, they wanted to take their life into a particular direction. And and so we got locked into this paradigm of this good and evil and good and evil and good and evil. It's the knowledge of good and evil that is 
all through society. But this experience with Jesus, he opens up the kingdom of heaven to us. We're no longer in this in the trenches down here. He gave us the keys to the kingdom. He's the gate. And when we form relationship with him, when we get with him on this one-on-one, -on -one, now I had this experience, Jesus is all glory, all sovereign, all God. But he later gave me experiences of him one-on-one. -on -one. He'd come to me in different ways. And in the last, I would say the last year, he's come to me looking like a very common person, but it's Jesus. I know his features. I know his, his demeanor. He says, you, you will know me by my spirit. He didn't say you'll know me by my appearance. So, so every time he's come, he's looked a little bit different. And he looks that way on purpose for me to learn something. Learn some. One time he came dressed as a warrior and he came to rescue me. And, and, and I saw scars on him. And I knew, okay, he's showing me what he did for me on the cross, but he's also showing me, I can call on him. He's my warrior. He is my hero. We have so many modern day heroes uh, today. You know, you get all these action heroes with their anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic demigods. You know, the kids are playing with these things like, no, you're missing the whole point. Jesus is the hero. He is the hero. So he came to me as a, as a friend, as a brother. And he, I wanted to look, I saw him in his glory. And what he's done over the years is he's come off that throne. He's come down through the ranks. And then he's come to me one-on-one -on -one in my room and spoken with me. And he's teaching. And it has taken me all my life to get to this. But, you know, I had to break off a lot of stuff. Had to get rid of the false paradigms that separate us from the Lord you know, and so it's been costly, but I've learned to take that kingdom of heaven here. I'm no longer down here with the good and evil, good and evil, health issues, this and that, this, that can go on forever and ever. It'll go on until that final war is done. When good and evil and the kingdom comes, that war will be done. And this, this thing that Adam and Eve had set up about the knowledge of good and evil, that book will be closed. That will be done. And it's all kingdom from that point on. So I've had access to the kingdom since, um, since these near-death events. It's sort of like um, softened my connection here, so I'm not so bound here. But I have found myself in heaven a few times, found myself walking with angels. And one time they said to me, I was walking, and um, I could see we were walking, and I suddenly became aware. And one of the angels says, oh, she's becoming aware. And they... They kind of dampened me out. And I woke up back on my bed. I know what Paul says is true. He says, we are seated in the high places with Christ, even though we're here. We have access to the kingdom. It's all through Jesus. He's the gate. And so what has been happening in the past few years, Randy, is volumes, all of these volumes, I think I showed you all of this. I have 16 volumes of handwritten downloading notes from from above, we have access to the halls of knowledge. We have access to healing. We have access to all of these things. That's what Jesus did for us, but we can't appropriate it if we're not walking with him. And through these near-death experiences and the weakening of my flesh and the weakening of pride and the, and the whole, all of this paradigm stuff of being uh, who we think we are, it's different. We're very different when we're in the kingdom. And that's what I've learned. That is what I've learned that how we really are and who we truly are in Christ is different than it's, it's not the same. Like here you're, you know, you have a ministry, you're identified as a minister, you're a dad, you're identified as a, as a father, you're a husband, you're identified as a husband say, so, you know, me, I'm a wife, uh, you know, so on. And, but what happens is when you move into the kingdom and you have this kingdom mindedness that Jesus appropriated for us, you are a kingdom person. You're a servant of the most high God. And, and this shifts, it shifts your paradigm completely. And so these experiences have really, no matter how hard they seem, like Paul says, it's just, you know, a short thing. Don't, no matter what we go through here, when you're on that other side, it is just a finger prick. It's like, boom, okay. Yeah. But now we're onto the real stuff. Now we're onto what God wants for us. Now we're into serving the Lord in, in, in these, in these amazing ways. And I think that's where uh, 
And that's, and I have dedicated so much of my time when I went through my fourth near death, I said, that's it. I'm tired. I cannot, I can't live in this world. God, either heal me or kill me because I'm done here and I depend on you. And I surrendered everything to him. And I started remembering what I was taught about the kingdom. And that is praise and worship. How do the angels deal with it? How do the angels fight these demons? I've seen them fighting. How do they fight them? And come back with such a sweet and amazing demeanor. And they showed me. And it's praise and worship and spend time with the Lord. There is no other substitute for it. Nothing can substitute the time waiting on the Lord. I would wait up for hours at night, years. This is the last three years. I would stay up for hours waiting on him, waiting on him. I'd wake up in the morning. I'd praise. I was grateful. I have little post-it notes everywhere in my house, you know, the glory of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, you know, he keeps his promises everywhere in order to remind me. And I got rid of all the bad scripts, the identity of sickness, the identity of illness, the identity of hardship. I got rid of it all. And I realized that those were all paradigm programs designed to take away what he had given us for the kingdom. And I started putting those scriptures up before me and reading the scriptures and they became alive. What I was missing, Randy, in all those years was I knew how to call on Jesus. I knew how to pray. I didn't know how to worship. And I didn't know how to spend time waiting on him, waiting on him. It, it, was, it, it, it was like, I thought I was doing that before. No, Jesus is not a vending machine where, hey, Lord, thank you for this. Thank you for that. And, oh, I need this. Oh, thank you for cling. Thanks for answering my prayer. See ya. Got to go. Come back. Jesus, I need that. You know, we spend maybe a lot of time doing that. And he's like, okay, yeah, you're going to keep pulling my arm. You're going to keep doing this. Your day is coming. You're going to need me more than what you think. And you know what? I'm glad I had to learn it this way. I couldn't have learned it any other way. He tried every way. He gave me his glory. Mm. And so what I learned is that this fellowship now that I have with him in drawing close to him and clinging to the Lord. And like King David said, he said, I, I, I call on you, oh Lord, answer me, you know, and, and he does. I call on you, oh God, you will answer me. Hear my prayer, you know, and, and, and so he does, and I stay close to him all the time. If I find myself wandering in thoughts, I stop, and I, I come right back to him. And this is the walking with the Lord that I learned. It's going to be different for everybody, but this is how he has journeyed me. In his spirit, I know when I'm in his spirit. I know when I'm out of his spirit. I can feel it. I know when his, he's speaking to me. I know the joy of the Lord. I wouldn't have known these things if I had not had to be broken down. And, and so I know people say, oh, God doesn't want sickness. Of course he doesn't want sickness. He doesn't want us to be ill. There's nothing about God that wants that. But he's holy. And he's not going to, he's already come down off his throne to be Jesus. He's not going to turn around and do it again and again because we're hard-headed. He gave us what we needed in Christ. And I had to come back to the Lord and really learn what this walking, fellowshipping, time, and waiting in silence on the Lord, silence and waiting. And then he began to talk and then he began to visit more. He'd been waiting for me to, to do that. And I, I, I didn't, it was all one way. So this is the most amazing thing that I learned. And this is what gave me access to the kingdom. Well, you know, that's, that's such a critical point, um, uh, Tina. And I know you have referenced the, uh, the fourth and final near-death experience. And I know that uh, we are coming to a close. However, I'm going to ask you just to touch briefly on that fourth near-death experience because we'd like to have you back to talk about, you know, the the wealth of um, insights and revelations that that you have learned through your experiences. And I know they've taught us. I do want to bring attention before we do that to the paintings behind you. Oh, um, that our viewers have been watching throughout this whole time. These are not store-bought uh, drawings or prints or paintings. These are the works of Tina. And what we were talking previous to this interview, 
that these were painted at various stages during your life and experience with the Lord. Yeah. And you've had a very unique experience from our previous interviews and in that you've had these various revelations through uh, these near-death experiences uh, and uh, they were painted at different times during the course of this. I'm just, I know we don't have time to really get into the details of each because they are unique to the, the uh, advent of each experience, but I do want to draw attention to this one to your right, right uh, shoulder now, the one there, uh, the one, the color uh, yeah. that is very vivid, the largest of the paintings there. Tell us a little bit about that before we get to the fourth and final near-death experience oh. and bring this to a close. Okay. Um, okay, I had, uh, in 2019, uh, I had a, a major reaction to uh, some medication. The doctors had misdiagnosed me and it literally affected my brain and caused inflammation and damage. And it went through my spinal cord. Anyway, long story short, coming out of that injury, um, I couldn't even walk a few steps, a few inches, and I'd fall over, and there was so much pain. That painting in 2020 was the first artwork I, I attempted coming out of my illness, and it's called Jesus in Living Color, and uh, it's kind of a modernist tweak, you know, um, but I wanted to do something with what he had given me. I know, you know, there's this guy that was uh, waiting by the pool um, and he hadn't walked in 38 years. And Jesus comes over and he says, get up, take up your mat and go home. And Jesus, when he healed people, he would often say, rise up and walk. In other words, if I'm going to heal you and I speak this over you, you better put it into action. Rise up and walk, you know, get up and do something. Move that body so my spirit can move through you. He's he got to have some action. So the first thing I did was was when I got my coordination back and, and my nervous system uh, started to come back, I painted that and it was mm. a tribute for him. It was like, Jesus, this is for you. You are the one who saved me. And there's a famous artist, um, I wanna say Thomas, Ma I, I could get it wrong, don't get me wrong. Anyway, he painted Jesus in that position. It's an old, old, old painting and I just took that, you know, that glance from that famous painting, and I wanted to put it in beautiful color. So yeah, it's called Jesus in Living Color. And, and I remember when the colors were bursting off of the throne and off of him, it nowhere compares to what I saw in heaven, but it's kind of a tribute to the, to the brightness and the cheerfulness and the upness of Jesus in his Holy Spirit. Before he died, the night before he died, he was praying for his disciples. There was nothing selfish. He said, God, I want them. To, this is so amazing. In, in John, he says, God, I want them to see me where I am. Now, here he is walking the earth, about to die the night before, and he's praying for his 12 and those that loved him. And he says, I want them to see me where I am. That's amazing revelation. I want them to see me where I am am where is he he's on the throne and it, it just it just amazed me so this is a tribute to to that and the revelation you know he's he can be standing with you he can be standing with me he can be standing with a hundred other people but he is on that throne and he's in heaven it's just it's it's mind-blowing <laughs> <laughs> i love that tina because uh when uh, when he was being judged before his crucifixion, he was asked who he, to declare himself, who he was. And he said, I am. And uh, you just expressed that. He is in the moment of our lives. He is in, he is the I am. He That's is right. not defined by time, space, or any other element. He is I am, the creator of all things. And uh, he knows the hairs on our head as well as... Uh, the, the macro of our life. And in fact, I am is the name given to God in the, uh, in the book of Exodus. I've got to say this before we uh, uh, move, move on to a quick uh, summary of the fourth NDE, and then we'll come to a close. Um, I've been asked many times and others, of course, you, I'm, I'm sure, 
to explain, describe what Jesus looks like. And um, it is one of the least uh, favorable questions that I receive because it's not about the color of his eyes or the texture of his hair and all of those features, physical or, or spiritual features. It is about his personhood. Uh, and But I've got to say, the, the one to your right shoulder and the one behind you that is kind of a faded approach, I don't see it uh, completely, but those just strike me uh, as somebody who would paint those uh, having been in heaven because they do reflect um, the, the nature of the portrayal of Jesus in a more accurate way than you know, 90 some odd percent of all of the paintings and pictures that I've seen. So that is truly inspirational. And what you say resonates with me and the experience that not only I had, but other experiences that we've had. I, that's why I know this is genuine. I know this is real. This is true. This is uh, what God did and, and who he is. So let's conclude, Tina, with that final, I know there's a, a lengthy part of this, but if you can get as kind of the reader's digest of uh, this fourth NDE and what happened uh, okay. in the conclusion of the journey. Well, like I said, um, you know, I had been, I didn't mention this earlier, but I had been hit with migraines all my life, genetic. My mom had them, they ran in the family. And I got, I just got so worn out. Um, we had moved into this new house the one I'm in now. And suddenly my health and everything started to take a, a strange turn um, for the worse. And I thought it was out of the dark and um, some bad things happened. I, I had a reaction. They gave me some medication for migraine and I had, I started getting anxiety and first it was low grade. Then it went into higher grade and I couldn't understand what was going on. Um, then they gave me something else. And uh, that started to affect me and anxiety started to turn into fear. What I didn't understand was my body was telling me, no, 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 this is not for you. No, no, no. And I didn't see the signals. I, I couldn't understand what was going on. And I had lost my, um, I don't know how to explain it, Randy. I had faith in God, but maybe I hadn't just... Uh, trusted him. I was taking this medication and I had prayed for years for these migraines to go away. Finally, when I was on this medication, then they gave me something uh, else and I started to get depressed. Then they gave me some, and I had like four medications, five medications, and I was a wreck. And then um, this one that the doctor gave me, it was a misdiagnosis. I, I, I had a bad feeling about it. And he put me on the, I said, no, 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 no. Lowest, lowest dose. I only took like that much of it. And then I had a very bad experience. It felt like the back of my head had just blown out. And the, this medication affected my nervous system. It had actually damaged my brain and through my spinal cord, I could feel this fiery going down and radiating out through all of my limbs. And I basically got um, brain damage. And the amygdala of my brain started firing off 24 hours a day in terror. It was just And I went into the hospital. Um, I, I stopped being able to breathe. I went into convulsions. I went into the ER. Then they moved me into another hospital for 10 days where I was fighting for my life. But here's the interesting thing. There was always a part of my soul and always a part of my spirit that was taking hold of this saying, okay, what's going on? And I prayed and I, I prayed Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And, and I had all of these um, evil spirits trying to tear me down and, and destroy me. And I hung on to the Lord. I hung on to him. I hung on to his promises. And uh, I ended up coming out of the hospital. They, they had me on medication. And uh, what I did was whenever they uh, gave me the medication and they set the cup there, I would stick it, pretend I was taking it, stick it in the side of my mouth. And when they left, I'd spit it out. And I said, I'm done with this. I got out of the hospital. I said, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die at home. So I spent weeks in bed. And finally, what happened was there was a part of me aware of everything. 
And if I had the slightest bad thought, anything negative, whether it was from TV or anything, anything negative, my system shut down and, went, and I had to struggle to breathe again. And I was like, oh my gosh, Jesus is right. Our thoughts are powerful. And it dawned on me that every thought, every script that the enemy tries to inscript in us has an effect on our body, our soul, and our spirit. Because every thought I had, if my thoughts wavered to any possibility of failure, I began to die. And so this was the most amazing learning curve of harnessing my thoughts, remembering to breathe. I would wake up with no, without breathing, and it was like, breathe. Oh, yeah, breathe. <sighs> forcing myself to breathe, forcing myself. And I'd have to do this for an hour before my brain would kick in and go, oh yeah, we remember how to do that. Oh, you know, or I'd walk and suddenly fall with complete failure, uh, system failure and have to be helped up. I couldn't coordinate going across. I couldn't eat. I was down to 93 pounds. Anyway, what happened was, is I had to, I was broken and I had to lean on the Lord a hundred percent. You would think seeing him all in his glory on the throne breaks you. It doesn't, it lifts you. But there was a part of the consciousness in my soul of this paradigm, this limited paradigm here that had to be broken off. And that's what happened. It got broken off and I had to rely on the Lord day and night for everything, everything. So this is why I stuck scriptures on the wall and had to walk it out with a cane um, I would read the Psalms on my phone. If all I could do was take 10, 10 steps out of my front door before a system failure, I would do it. The next day I might get 11 steps. Next day I might get 20 steps or five or whatever. I never looked back. I said, it's a all or nothing. It's got to be all or nothing. I'm either into this thing of the Lord, hundred percent, pick up your mat and walk, or I'm done. And I... <laughs> I said, okay, I'm picking up my mat, Lord. I'm picking up my brush. And as and as time went on, um, so my accident was in um, the first part of 2019 in February to March. And I began to write these journals. My first one was in May when I could pick up a pen. And this is 2019. And the information began to flow and flow and flow like you wouldn't believe. I wrote and I was a I was a scribe from heaven. I began to write the downloads that just came pouring through. And I said, Lord, if that's what it took to break off this world and to break off these false paradigms and to get me into heaven and to get your truth here, then that's what it took. I'm bearing it. Let's do it. And I began to write and write and write. And all of this information came pouring out. I still had to walk it, Randy. I still had to walk through the pain. I think the pain uh, in the nervous system which was like getting stabbed a thousand times a day in every part of your body. That took a good two years before it lifted. And I was able to be mobile and get some of my, my, my normal life back, but I never quit. And Jesus kept coming back to me and visiting me one time, even in the worst part, he came up behind me and he put his arms around me and he whispered something so sweet. It's so tender to my heart. I can't repeat it, but it, again, it just helped me go forward. And when I was ill, my husband got a, a, a bad, uh, uh, he had this laryngeal problem where his laryngeal will swell up and he couldn't breathe and he's had it before. And here I am as ill as ever. I reached my hand over to his throat. I said, in Jesus name, be healed. And it went and shrunk up and he's never had the problem since. It's not me. It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with Jesus and his power, the Holy Spirit here I am flat on my back. How could that happen? It's because of him. And so I got to my, on my face and I said, Lord, I don't even know what holiness is. I am so messed up. I don't, I, I am so sorry. I don't know how I got here, but I don't even know what holiness is. I have no clue what holiness is. I said, I read it. I can understand it up here, but I don't know what holiness is. I read Isaiah and, and Paul says, you know, we work out our salvation by fear and trembling. And I'm like, we're talking to you, Jesus, like you're our buddy. What is this holiness thing? Well, Randy, I, I'll share this with you. And this is the most profound, uh, powerful experience next to seeing Jesus on his throne. The power of God came to me. And I said, I was crying. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm like a 
um, I'm like an ignorant person. I have no idea this holiness. What, what is this holiness? We say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. What is holiness? He comes in, and this is the almighty. Now, it's not Jesus, my friend, my brother. This is almighty. He comes in to my room, and suddenly my soul and all that I am, he splays it open. It's like he just takes all that, everything that I am and goes like this, and it's spread out. Now, in the book of Daniel, it says the seats are taken and the books were opened and everything is laid bare before the Lord. There's a scripture that says that. So what happened was I, dis I felt and I knew I was being splayed open like a book. Every, there was thousands of pages. Every page was a, a view of my life. Every event, good, bad, ugly, wonderful, it was all there. And I'm experiencing this being opened, bare before the Lord. And he, he has me gently and he just brrr, spreads me open like this. Every, I can't explain it. It's, it's like if you were a supernova and all that you are just got exploded into a million pieces and you are laid bare. Then he takes me through my whole life I got my whole life revealed to me in seconds. This. And then he goes, hmm. here you go. That's holiness. That's where you, and I was flat. When he came in, I was flattened out. And everything in my instinct, everything in my soul and spirit knew I was in the presence of this almighty. And I couldn't even stand up. It was so thick. And I went flat and then I bawled for days. I cried and cried and cried how ignorant I could have been. How could I have not? How, how could I? I'm sorry, God. I just suddenly had this reverential um, respect for God's authority and his, uh, this almighty. You know, it was like, oh, my God, it, he is holy and he is almighty. So every question I've asked, he's never academically answered. He's taken me through the experience. And he wants me to know it. Now you know it. You know it inside and out. So when I got that exposure to holiness and how he can just take us and go open, open close, I was, I was done. And I, ever since then, when I'm approaching the throne of God, when I'm coming into prayer, into the presence of the Lord, I am totally respectful and on my face. Or I'm back here or I wait for the angels to tell me, okay, yeah, okay, it's okay now. It's just amazing. And I wouldn't trade it for the world because I have it now in here, up here, but in here. And, um, and that is, that's an amazing journey. To, and to come out of that illness, I'm well now. In fact, I had, a, I had to fight off. I had to destroy that demon of the headaches. And I've never had a migraine since. Not a headache, not a tweak since then, since I've come through it. And this is the warfare. The warfare that we're on is, it says, it says in the scriptures that um, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. We're not here to sit here and lay on our laurels. We are on this amazing kingdom journey, and, and we've got to take it and take it serious. This is really amazing. So that's what I learned through these experiences and, and the glory of God and his great power, but also in that experience of him opening my soul, he was so tender and so loving. I, I can't express the dichotomy of this power, this sovereignty to take you all of what you are and spread it out, but hold you so tenderly and then put it back. So everything comes back perfect and hold you with such love. I've never experienced anything like that. Mm -hmm. And that is our God. Wow. Tina, uh, there are no I'm words. sorry to go in overtime. No, there are no words to uh, describe what this is like. You know, I'm following you, our journey together as a, uh, as a storyline, uh, because I, you know, I'm, I'm constantly looking for themes in, in you present a thematic approach and you have volumes recording, uh, what you've experienced that testify of a journey that progresses to a, a holiness. And that is uh, from your initial uh, experience, your afterlife or near-death experience encounter uh, where there was uh, warfare, spiritual warfare going on, uh, battle over your 
uh, your soul, if you will, that I can empathize with. I experienced something similar mm -hmm. to the next segue, which is the experience then again over this battle and the Lord revealing himself more fully to you, causing healing throughout uh, this, this journey. Yeah. The third being the full revelation of the glory of God in his fullness. And the fourth being the holiness that he has imparted to you. And that comes through, it comes through you, what you've shared your life and your wisdom that you have shared with each of us. Um, Tina, now we want to, and please, uh, uh, if you're uh, viewing this now, there's something that the Lord is going to impart to you. Uh, this impartation to you from the throne of God is one of healing, yeah. is one of freedom, and one of um, uh, revelation of his personhood to you. So uh, this is very important, a very important moment as we close this. Uh, so I know Tina, you and I will join together in this prayer, uh, leading others in prayer to receive that impartation. So uh, let's, let's do that now. Just follow, follow with this. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, pray that same prayer because you're going to see in this uh, your commitment to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, which is going to be your revelation of your journey uh, in Christ. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you that you are with us even now and always that you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. We ask in the name of Jesus, Yeshua, that you would take control of my life right now. Forgive me of all of my sins. I know I've I failed you. I know I failed you too many times. And Lord, I know that you sacrificed yourself on the cross to take the price, the penalty of my sins upon you. And Lord, I thank you for that sacrifice that you made. I pray now that you would take all of those failures, all of those hurts, all of those pains, all of those uh, sufferings that I have experienced and all of my personal failures, and I lay them down at your feet. Take them from me, Lord, and become, just increase your lordship over my life and, and, uh, I ask you to be Lord of my life in all areas of my life, that you would take control and that you would reveal to me the fullness of your glory such that I might walk in the fullness of your purpose for me and I might live out the rest of my days honoring you until that one glorious day when I can be with you face to face in the heaven on the day that you walk with me from this life into eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. T Tina, this has been such a pleasure being with you today. And uh, I, for those who would like to continue the conversation with Tina or to comment, you can go to randyk.org, uh, go to the comment section, and uh, we'll make sure if you have a, a message, a comment to uh, Tina, uh, that we'll get that over to her. Also in the body of the YouTube, you can make your comments. Uh, Tina will be able to uh, respond to those as well uh, if, if uh, she's able. And also we will we'll be premiering this. Uh, it, you're in the midst of our end of the premiere if you're, if you're here now, but um, that is something that we'll be doing, which will be a two-way interaction for all of our interviews. You'll have the opportunity to the dialogue uh, usually with me at least, and sometimes our guests. Uh, so um, please uh, log on to randyk.org where we're, we're giving you updates because uh, we're gonna be inviting Tina to participate in, in other activities that we have uh, within the ministry. Um, and again, Tina, I just go back to you and say thank you so much. And I'm gonna leave you with any parting words that you would like to say to our audience. Oh, thank you, Randy, and thank you for your tender and precious prayer for people 
there is a, a, a sweetness in the atmosphere of your words. And I think that is very, very important for people. Um, to, to people who are struggling and going through um, things they think are un, unable to overcome or unsurmountable where they cannot um, uh, find their way out, I'm telling you, Jesus will walk you through it. He will walk you through it, even if it's a hair's breadth at a time. Every step you take, every scripture you read, every note you post, every gloryful, glory song you sing, every beautiful thing that you embrace is going to take you closer and closer. And he wants you to see what amazing good things he has for you. He has a storehouse of treasures for you to unfold in your life. And he wants you to come out of identity in illness or sickness or sorrow and into his spirit, which is full of joy. It's full of joy. And it sometimes seems like it's a big chasm, but there's a saying that says you can only eat an elephant one bite at a time. <laughs> and so in order to go to this through this journey, you take it one step at a time with the Lord, one step of, and trust, trust him and everything will change everything. I'm no one special. His spirit in me is what does the changes and him walking in me is what does the changes. So I would say, continue to pray, continue to look up, continue to look forward and not back. And God will do amazing things in your life. Well, that deserves a praise, the praise Lord the Jesus, Lord. Yeshua. And uh, Jesus. we're going to close for now, but uh, thank you again for joining us and for staying through to the very end. Uh, we pray blessings over you. And until next time, be of good cheer, because if you are in Christ, heaven is in your future. Take care and God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.